name's Kevin Backus, and the family business that I work for with my parents and with my other siblings is called Backus Poultry. We've been in business for 80 years. The business was started by my grandfather 80 years ago. We've been grandfathered into the state inspection program. We've been under USDA and state inspection since 1970. We also raise and slaughter our own birds. We have done raise and slaughter for most of my life, which is going on a little over 40 years. And as opposed to some places that most of what you guys are probably looking for is to be able to have it to where you raise them and then sell them. Is that a good assessment? Raise a hand for those that that's what they're wanting to do, okay? For others, just wanting to be able to know more about poultry processing, that's fine too. Glad you're here. Thank you for coming. We're here today because we were awarded a SAR grant. We're helping small farmers with poultry processing. There are exemptions in place. We talked outside about whenever you have less than a thousand birds and you want to process them on your own plant, you can sell them from your facility. But if you get above that or if you want to go to farmers markets, you need to have state inspection. And that's part of what our family has been able to help people with. There's numerous people, matter of fact, where we got the scalder and the picker from outside. That is from someone that we process birds for them at our facility. So we do this for numerous people, Fayette, Herman. We also have people come from Columbia down to our facility. There are some that sell at the farmer's markets here. A big part of their market is being able to sell to grocery stores in St. Louis. Why do they need to come to our plant? State inspection. They can't just have it to where I've got some good chickens. I'll take them to this plant and sell them. You can't really do that. We want to be able to keep it safe for the customers. That's part of what we're here today is to have people understand safer processing practices, but also helping all of you that want to be able to make some money at it to be able to make more money at it. Bacteria in chickens. Salmonella and E. coli is probably the two most common forms that people know about. We hear about that all the time. We also have Listeria air sac and Campy Labaster. The most two common forms are Salmonella and E. coli. We took a temperature reading. Who remembers what the temperature was when we tested that bird? 92. Unfortunately, if you would take that bird and you say, you know what, I've gotten this chicken, I'm going to take him home and I'm going to throw him in the freezer. Put him in a Ziploc bag, I'll get him out when I want to eat him. You've taken that bird at 90 degrees and sealed them in a Ziploc bag, there's going to be salmonella crawling all over that chicken. That's why we want to get temperatures down. That's part of why we use ice and we use water. Right bird equals dollars. We had some talk outside as well. We were talking about frying pan specials. We were talking also about the birds that we use, which is Cornish cross. If you're wanting to have Cornish cross birds, you're wanting to raise them to eat. If you're wanting to raise leghorns or things like that, you're wanting to raise them for eggs. Now, as you can see in this picture, we have some baby chicks. Those are ones that are going to grow. Those birds were five weeks old we just did outside. You're not going to be able to get that with birds that aren't made for raising for meat. Taking a guess at these two chickens. One is five and a half weeks old. One is 11 weeks old. I think you know from what I talked about earlier which one is 11 and which one is five. The bigger one is five and a half. The one that is on to our right is 11 weeks old. It is what we call the frying pan special. You buy it at your normal farm and home store. They have them available. I and mean, you can eat it. It's not a bad thing to eat. But if you're wanting to be able to have it to where you're selling it for meat, you sell, if you tell someone you're going to get them fresh poultry, which one do you think they want to buy? They're going to want to buy the one that has more meat on it. This is an example of the raising environment that we have. We talked about confinement, but these are baby chicks. 
This whole building they can have to run around in whenever they get older. We make them in these little brooders. We keep them around this heating element so they can stay warm. They have food and they have fresh water that's changed out daily. You want to be able to have where there's open airflow, where there's no overcrowding, and you want to keep moisture down. Here's a very important part about the moisture. Think about moisture and what it does whenever, this is just a Kevin Backus story, okay? I get cold feet, so I wear socks when I go to bed. Whenever I wear these socks, my feet sweat, and then my feet get cold again because they've sweat. Okay, now think about if you're a small chicken and you get wet, you're going to be cold as well. So you want to be able to have it to where you're putting the chickens into a dry environment. These birds, can everyone see this? This is a slide of birds that we processed at our plant. Now that is not poop that is on them. That is not what's on their chest. What that is from is from ammonia burns. And the reason that they had ammonia burns is they were raising them on concrete. And if you're raising them on concrete, that poop is on the concrete. And that ammonia from that poop is going to cause them to have a rash, which is what they have here, and it causes a burn. Now we go back to the above slide. We use sawdust. You can use different things to keep it dry. It doesn't have to be sawdust, but that's what we use. But you look at to where it also, if you keep them dry, it's going to keep them warm. It's also going to make for a better product. Who, in all seriousness, who would want to eat a chicken that they see that has this type of burn on their chest? Not very many people. You take it to a store to sell it, it's not going to look very good. You have it to where you also want to be able to reduce the sickness by keeping it dry. Who's ever had pneumonia? Okay, I get pneumonia every year whether I want it or not. So if you get pneumonia, it's kind of like an infection in that for birds too, air sac. What causes that is because of their breathing, they're having breathing problems and it'll cause their lungs to become infected. So if you have a drier environment, it's gonna be able to keep that from happening. Now questions, I don't wanna to take too long because our presentation does end at five. But do we have questions about rate, right bird and a raising environment? If you have questions, you can come to the microphone or you can just raise your hand from your seat. Okay? Reducing pre-slaughter bacteria. The number of people that you come in contact with your birds. If you have a friend of yours, we have Paul the pig raiser that comes to your to Charlie Chicken's plant. Whenever he comes there, Paul has his shoes that he's worn into his hog pens. Now he's going to raise, bring them into your chicken house. Now you're cross-contamination. That's a good way to get to where you have cross-contamination. We've heard about this whenever you look at people that, okay, I used a knife to cut open a chicken. Well, I'm going to use the same knife to cut up my lettuce cross-contamination. You also, we talked about mixing animal fecal matter. That's what we want to stay away from. Feed used. It really doesn't matter what kind of feed you use. You just want to be able to have something that's going to help them to grow. They can eat bugs. They can eat grass. There's different things that they can eat. You just want to be able to have something that's going to allow them to gain weight at the rate you want them to gain it. You don't want to be feeding them something that, I wonder, I keep feeding them and feeding them and they don't grow. You want to be able to feed them and have them to where they're able to grow at the ro rate you want to have them grow. Rodents, of course, you want to keep those out of any of your meat processing plants. Free water flow. If you would just have a pan of water, I take this jug of water, I set it in the house for the chickens to drink out of for days. It's plenty of water. They drink it, and they're going to have water left over. But that water is not remaining fresh. So you want to be able to have it where that fresh water flow is going to also cut down on bacteria as well. Baseballs and feed withdrawal. This slide 
shows chickens that we have slaughtered. And do you remember how big that opening was for whenever we pulled out the craw and the windpipe? Probably about this big. Take this amount of feed in that craw to get through this hole. It's not really going to work. We caught those birds this morning at around 5.30, 5.45 this morning. They had completely had the feed out of their craw by the time we slaughtered them, right? So that means you're not having any feed in the craw. But if you have all this feed, they are not going to make, for one, they're not going to have any feed conversion. There's no way they eat that and it's going to instantaneously make them grow weight. You're wasting money because that feed is just going to be thrown away whenever we're cutting the birds open. And also, if you're looking at, remember when we pulled that neck outside and how I said it didn't have any feed in the craw? If you have feed in the craw, it's going to make it where that feed's released onto the neck and possibly onto other parts of the bird, which can contaminate it. So that's why you want to withdraw from the, the feed earlier. And when you think about the fecal matter as well, Notice how we didn't have a lot of fecal matter that was coming out whenever we were cutting open the birds? That's because they had had enough of the feed withdrawal from them so they didn't have to worry about it coming out. It's like us. We eat. If you're going to be eating, that release of food's going to come from you eating. So you want to be able to have it where you've given yourself enough time to have it to where they, usually six hours is fine. We've had it where it's been eight, 10. You can do 12. Someone said 24, you could do 24. You could do 24 hours, but six hours is usually going to be enough. There's numerous people that have come to our facility that have had it to where they actually have just put food in their cages to transport to our plant to have killed, and that really doesn't translate into a very economical choice for them. Clean birds to kill. Clean before kill is a good start. So that means, remember the ones that had the ammonia burns? If you have a good raising environment, you have a good place where you are raising them, you're going to be able to have it to where that bird's going to be more clean to start with. Bacteria, if you can be able to keep them from being able to, if you will, poop all over the place, you've had it to where they've been off the feed long enough to where they're not going to contaminate themselves. Now, airing them out. I'm going to show this next slide. Now the upper right hand corner is the truck that we use. We have coops that we bring our chickens in. We also have people that use different trailers for bringing chickens to us. See how there's plenty of open air in there? So they're gonna be able to have to where whenever they are to our facility, they can, be, do we need to turn these other lights off? We can't, okay. Maybe if we could have everyone come closer, is that going to help any? It's not? Sorry. But if you have clean transportation, which means we're not cross-contaminating, we didn't one day haul the pigs, the next day we haul the chickens without cleaning out the trailer, that's not the best idea. But if we're going to be able to have it to where they can ride, to where they're not getting squished all over the place, because chickens will pile up. If it's cold, they're going to pile together. And when they pile together, they're probably going to smother themselves. Then you're looking at losing birds. Questions about getting chickens prepared for slaughter. Does anyone have questions? Okay. Sanitation. Very important. A daily checklist, which is what we call our SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. Every day, we write our SOP. It's part of our HACCP plan. We'll be talking about HACCP here in a little bit. Our SOP is standard operating procedure. Every day, before we slaughter, we clean this. We clean it with chlorinated water. We make it sure that everything has been cleaned the day before when we slaughter. You have that same pattern that you do every time. It's your standard operating procedure. That's what we do. We're an inspected plant. We have to do it. Even if you don't have, if you're not under inspection and you, don't, you aren't required to have an SOP, you still need to have sanitation. We need to be clean. 
You don't want to be able to have birds that you're, ask, you're asking people to buy from you that you haven't had a clean facility to process them in. Outside, we were using some water flow, right? And someone asked me, wouldn't you, wear, wouldn't you wear an apron? You would if you're using a lot of water to keep yourself from getting drenched, right? But you want to be able to have it to where when you're cleaning soap and water, chlorination, some people actually use citrus to be able to process with, to be able to get it where it's clean. I've heard vinegar and water as well to be able to use as a cleaning agent. You want to be able to have clean products and clean equipment. Dirty area. Outside, for those that have never processed birds before, they probably thought the whole thing was dirty area. But what a dirty area is, is whenever you have to where you've got a part of your facility that you're going to be killing your birds at. <coughs> In this slide, we have a tunnel, which is where we hang the birds, to let them bleed out. We have a dunker, which automatically allows them to be able to go up and down. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now, the slaughtering is done in this area. Hazardous analysis and critical control points is what we have as far as a HACCP plan. That is what we have given to the state of Missouri to say this is what we will do so that our plant will be able to be able to be inspected and that you can be able to be here. You have to have a HACCP plan. You write your own. If you want to do it, you write your own HACCP plan. Now I write common sense when non-HACCP. What I mean by that is I'm talking about, let's say that you're wanting to slaughter some birds and you're thinking to yourself, well, I used the water yesterday to scald them. I'll just use it again. That's not the best idea. You want to be able to have it to where you're slaughtering birds and having it to where they're being done in an environment that is fairly clean, even though it's a dirty area. Now, this is another setup. This is, we did another, similar to this, we did a presentation somewhere where they had been given a grant to build this on the back of a trailer. They have their dirty area, which is their killing area, then their picker, and then their cleaning table, and then also where they have the chilling for the birds as well. Here's another setup, very rudimentary, but similar to what we had outside. To where you're allowing the birds, you just have normal traffic cones, cut the end off of those traffic cones, you stick the chickens through the, through the end of the, the cones, and then you use the dunker, I mean, you use the scalding pot, and then you use the picker. We're going to be showing slides of this as we go through as well. Now let's get to some dirty work. Someone outside asked, why don't you just cut their heads off? Just whack them off. You know, I've heard stories of, well, what we did is, whenever I was a kid, when I was a kid, you step on one end, and then grandma would be on the other end with the ax and cut the head off. The reason you don't do that is because that makes for more running around, right? The birds are going to be flopping around, moving around. They're not constrained. You have it to where those shackles that we used outside are exactly the same ones we use in our plant. It's a spring-loaded device, keeps them in place, and allows them to be able to bleed out. Also makes for easier cleanup. You don't have to where they're just going all over the place, running around. Now, remember the feed withdrawal? And we talked about where you cut that slit in the neck. If you cut it, <clears throat> if you cut into that vein where they have the food, the craw, that's going to contaminate that neck. Then when you pull that out, it's going to contaminate the bird when you gut it. So you want to be able to have it to where you've got that feed withdrawal. It's very important. This is another place that they did a setup. They have cones, very similar to what we did outside. You just cut their heads, cut their, slit their neck, and it's going to bleed out. Here's another setup. Just put them through the end of the cones, and it's a very easy way to do it. It's also very, I mean, you look at this ladder and those cones, it's not that expensive. It's not going to be where you're spending a fortune trying to do this. Questions about killing the birds? Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Scalding the birds. This is probably where some people, some of you want to really know temperatures and times. 
You can use steam. We use hot water, just like we did outside. You want to test the water as we were doing, where it's 140 degrees, and you want to have agitation. That allows more of the feathers to be able to come off. The graph I have down here at the bottom, we talked about a hard scald and a soft scald. Hard scald is where all the yellow comes off the outside. Soft scald is where some of that yellow skin stays on. It's still edible. You can still eat it. It's just not as presentable when you look at it. Turkeys, you can also do. We do those at our facility, too. But you see the times and the temperatures. The hard skull is right at 140 for about 75 seconds at the most. You look at the soft scald, 130 seconds for about two minutes. 130 degrees, I'm sorry, for two minutes. Then turkeys, a little bit warmer in between, right about 140, and you can do those for about a minute or longer. They were using essentially the same pot that we were using, just having it to where they're dunking them down. Now, one thing that this next person did that I thought was really neat is he actually had a heating element he put in his to get the water up to that temperature, and then he just kind of used the propane tank to maintain it, not full blast, but just to maintain the heat. It allows them to be able to process them at a quicker rate. Questions about scalding the birds? Yes. If you over scald, you want to be able to turn it into chicken salad instantaneously, that's what will happen. Because what you're going to do if you over scald the birds, they're going to tear apart. That meat is actually being cooked. If you would turn it up to, let's say we go to 150, 155, I want to get those feathers off faster by doing a higher water temperature. What's going to happen is that skin is going to break and then the meat is going to be chewed up, essentially, in your picker as you're picking them apart. So you want to be able to maintain that water temperature. Very good question, Debbie. Thank you. Is there another? Yes, sir. Yeah. If you're going to do many in one day, like 30 or 40, do you need to change the water along the way? Not as long as you have enough water if you're keeping to where you're adding water to it, because those birds are taking water out with them. You know, if you're adding water to it, you're not going to have to do that. If you would have it to where, okay, we've got that one pot, we're going to do 100 chickens, chances are that water's going to be pretty dirty by the time you get done with it. I mean, the water, trust me, the water that we use is also, I mean, it's brown by the time we get done, but it still is clean enough to be able to use. It's not contaminating the birds because there's no, what is in the birds is filtered down to the bottom, so the birds are not actually touching that whenever they're being scalded. Yes, ma'am. How many birds do you do before you would change the water? I would say you'd probably be looking at around in, are we talking for something like outside? Okay, if you would be doing them in that type of scenario, I'd say if you do close to around six or 700, you'd still be okay. If you'd be doing them something like outside, you'd probably want to change it maybe every 50, just because it, and you don't want to have it where you're constantly using that same water. Other questions? You want to be able to, those feathers are going to hold bacteria. Thank you very much for my brother-in-law for pulling all those feathers. But you want to be able to have it to where those feathers hold bacteria. So the more feathers you have on the bird, the more they're going to hold the bacteria. What we'll be showing you in actual slides from our poultry processing plant, there's water that's flowing in this picker. So it keeps those feathers continually coming off. And automation, hey, if you want to be able to do it by hand, you know, go back to the days of old and have a throwback moment with you and your kids. It's cool. But I would recommend automation because it's going to make that time frame a lot shorter. If you do that by hand, you're talking probably a few hours. Here's a plucker that was used. It's actually bigger than the one that we have at our plant. That grant provided this plucker. It's probably, I would say, at least three feet wide. This is something that I think a lot of you have probably seen or may use on your own. You can purchase these. They're very low cost. 
you have it to where the birds have been scalded. You put this picker together, which is essentially a polyurethane drum with fingers in it. He has a spinning wheel on the bottom. For the water, he uses a spray hose to spray the water into it. That allows them to be able to get cleaned off from the feathers. Now, questions about plucking the birds. I'm going to show a video. Pardon me while I change over to a different screen here. Now this is the way that we do it. I've turned the sound down for mercy because we don't want to hear this throughout the entire building. But I'm going to get to where a part where it's going to show you how we cut the birds and how they bleed out at our facility first. Now the reason I zoom in is people had asked where you cut them. So on this photo we're going to be able to see it a lot closer. You're cutting them right under where they where their beak is kind of where their jawline is as you can see we're just cutting that slit we're not cutting deep you know we're not trying to get deep into the meat it's just cutting that vein to get it to where they're bleeding out and as we cut that vein you guys saw them outside where I had cut their vein they're not flopping around like crazy because their nerves have not been reacted yet so they don't really realize it now here are some birds that have already been killed. They've died off. And now we're going to put those in our scalder. Now our scalder is powered by compressed air. And it's going to go up and down. We do this for probably about two minutes. Now I'm not going to show the same slide over and over because this could be a long time. But you can see how they're going up and down, how they're being agitated. Okay, it's getting those feathers to where they're being lots of water is getting through them now I'm gonna go to the picker which is probably what everyone is wanting to see now here's the picker I'm gonna back it up just a little bit now I'm gonna show these picker it has a bottom spinning wheel on the bottom and then it has fingers on the side. You can see the water is dripping down in there to allow for that moisture to be able to keep those feathers coming off. How, th how long do you think you'll have to pick a chicken in this picker? They'll be done in 30 seconds. And you'll see how clean they are whenever they get done being picked as well. I think we're just about there. Whenever we're doing the picking as well, we take them right from the scalder, five at a time, and we drop them into the picker. Now we're ready to go with them. Now they're spinning around. This is actual time. I have not done any editing to this. So they're spinning around, and you can see them being cleaned as we're going here. And at the end of 30 seconds, we're going to let them out. You can see they still have their feet and their heads on. And after the 30 seconds is over, They've been picked clean, and then they're ready to be finished out, and that'll be another video that we'll be showing. This drum picker, we've had it for around 40 years. So it's something that has been, it's from Pickwick Company. Now we put another bunch in there next, but I won't reiterate. Fr from that video, though, is there questions that people have? Any questions that you would like to ask about it? No question. Yes, sir. Yep. This is an example of probably what you're talking about here. It's a polyurethane drum that has fingers stuck in the side of it. Those work very well for a small processing, in all honesty. If you're looking at to where you want to be able to keep your costs down, I think they're under probably a few hundred bucks. And you can be able to have it to where you just use the water hose to spray the water in there to keep them, keep those feathers coming off. 
and those are very easy to use. We've actually used them at the one of the workshops we gave. We used their equipment for it, and it worked very well. Yes, sir. Cold water. Just regular water is what we use when we spray it in there. It doesn't have to be hot. They've actually gotten all the hot water they need whenever they're in the scalder. Actually, a rendering company picks them up from us, and then they turn them into feed. But that's what we do with them. They actually, we pay them. Yep. Questions about the dirty area? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. I mean, you can do it. I mean, just to answer what we use for them, I mean, we have barrels and barrels and barrels that we're getting rid of. But if you're looking at to where you want, that's up to you. You can do whatever you want with them. Now we're going to a much more friendly place, a place that people are more comfortable with, the clean area. We want to be able to keep the equipment clean as well as being able to have it to where we remove the feet, we remove the heads, we clip the neck, and we keep the equipment clean. We clean all of our equipment, knives, tables, everything we use every day after our processing is done. We have water flowing the entire time whenever we're gutting our chickens out. We already covered clipping the heads and clipping the feet. These are examples where we did it somewhere else. You want to be able to have a table. Doing it with open air doesn't work so good. We usually use a mix of bleach and a soap, type of laundry soap, dry laundry soap, and bleach together. Any questions about the clipping the heads and feet? I know I asked that outside, so I don't, I'm trying to speed up through this because most people already know this part from outside, but if you have questions, please ask. All right, we talked about removing the neck, windpipe, oil gland, about cutting under the tail and pulling out the end of the intestine. Now outside, I was doing what you would call a J cut, which is cutting up. You can also do a bar cut, which is cutting across. It doesn't really matter whichever way you want to do it. The easier way to do it is the J cut because you're just taking your knife up and you're not having to move the bird around to cut into it this way. The important thing is when you do it is to not cut into that intestine when you do it because that looks at contamination. When we do the cutting of the J cut or the bar cut, it just makes it easier for you to be able to get into the side of the bird. Here's where we're at another workshop that we did. Here's my, the person with the knife there is actually my dad. And whenever we went to these workshops, this individual was very inquisitive, but he learned a lot about processing chickens that day. Questions about cutting open. Does anyone have any questions about cutting open the birds? Gutting, we pull out the guts, we pull out the lungs, save the giblets. I know we talked about outside. If you want to save the liver, the heart, and you want to save the gizzard, you can be able to do that. They're perfectly edible. Actually, I love to eat gizzards myself. <clears throat> but that also adds time to what you're doing as well. If you're doing a few at a time, it's not that big a deal. If you're looking at processing these to where you want to be able to sell them at market, you want to be able to get them done probably as quickly as you can. So that's a choice that you want to be able to make. An important part of that, though, trimming the hearts is you're taking off the top part of that, the, I guess it's the valves of the heart. The liver, you need to remove the gallbladder. That is an absolute must. That is close to poisonous, if not poisonous. And actually, if you get it in your eyes, you need to flush your eyes out immediately because it'll actually cause you to be able to have different problems with your eyes. There, um, whenever you get it, gall is something that whenever it gets into the eye, I don't know what it causes, but it really can cause you to have bad vision and actually make it to where it needs to be flushed out immediately. Gutting chickens, we saw how to gut chickens outside. Oh yeah, sure. Uh -huh. the, the best way to do it is to have it to where you get your fingers behind it close to the liver 
And then when you get it close to the liver, you're separate a little bit at a time, and then you just pull it away. That gall is sensitive enough to where you don't want to just grab it like you know, you're squeezing it, but you want to be able to pinch close to the liver, almost like you're pinching the liver to release it, and then it will come off. That's, cutting it is actually not going to help because that's going to release it and make it where it gets all over everything. Now we're going to show a video of how we gut chickens, clip off heads and feet, <clears throat> this is at our facility as well. I'm going to get to the part where we see different pieces of it. Now here's an up close and personal look at cutting open and gutting chickens. As you can see, this can be done rather quickly. We saw it outside. Does anyone need to see it again? I don't want to reiterate. I mean, we can... I can go through it or not. Yes, sir. Uh, we don't have a website. We don't have, my, my parents actually do not know what the internet is. <laughs> Correct. Yes, and actually we'll be doing a webinar with a small, is it small farm? Yes, we'll be doing a webinar later on in the year. I think probably next year, I think, with that. We are not. No. We actually have an inspector that's there with us as we're processing these birds, so no, we are not. If you look at it from this perspective, whenever we're processing, this is still a bird that has not been completed. You know, if you get them home, they're looking at cross-contamination whenever you're working in food processing, whereas we're working with the same birds over and over. Instead of, okay, I'm going to work with hamburger, now I'm going to go over to pork, now I'm going to go over to chicken. You know, you're working with the same product over and over. Now, I wanted to show something as well about, I think it's, We actually just have a running hose of water that we use. Yes, yes we do. As you can see, there's a water hose that's running there. We rinse them after every bird that we got. Now, <clears throat> I also wanted to go a little bit further into the presentation as far as here is where, sure, go ahead. Yes, we do. We, we normally have it to where we keep the neck and we keep the liver. If it's gizzard and heart, then that's additional because that's additional work that we're having to do to be able to have them for the person that wants them. Is that all, sir? Okay. Here is a part that I was not able to show outside, but whenever you're looking at rinsing the birds, we want to make sure they're clean. Running water is a must, have to have. The flushing method has it to where you're holding the bird under the water, letting it, the, water, the breast cavity fill with water, and you're flushing it out. The immersion method is where you have a tub of water that you change out regularly. You lift the birds out, they drain out of water, and then you're going to throw them into a chill tank. This person here has a water spigot they're using. They've converted a sink that they're using. Works fine. Questions? Yes. Ours is actually our own well, and we have to have it tested. Yes. Yes. Chilling out. This is a part of the presentation that is probably where a lot of people go from having a perfectly clean bird to having a bird that is suddenly going to be not good for you to eat. If you would take the birds that we just had outside that we processed at 92 degrees, 
you tick them in a Ziploc bag and you throw them into the, your freezer, what do they still have on them whenever they go into the freezer? E. coli and salmonella. Because you have not gotten them down to 40 degrees. 40 degrees is that, mag is that magic number of where that bacteria stops growing. You want to be able to have in these tanks that we have, these are galvanized steel. We've got ice and we've got water. We do a ratio of about one pound of ice, one pound of ice per bird. And now we're looking at to where this is what they used in another facility. They had tanks that they put chunks of ice in. That's also chilling them down to a certain degree temperature. Here is what I think is the best way if you're looking at to where you've killed the birds. You want to be able to have it to where you don't have galvanized tanks. You don't have the ability to be able to put them in a huge tank to be able to store them, right? Outside, my brother-in-law Randy, also known as Mr. Picker, he put these chickens that we did in on ice and put water with them. Now what's the water do that allows them to circulate around and get them cooled off faster? They were 92 degrees. Usually when we throw the birds into the tank, they're around 100. Now Randy, you wanna do a temperature check on one of those? If you get them down to 40 degrees, that's going to stop that bacteria from growing. Now I'm gonna do a quick time check. We've been inside for about 45 minutes. Now you do that temperature check, the size of the birds, time to get down to 40 degrees. You can't just set them in a tub of water and let them set there forever. They have to have ice. This graph shows if it's a four pound bird, about four hours you have to get down to 40 degrees. Eight pound bird, eight hours. What are we at now, Randy? About 62 degrees in 45 minutes. That's pretty good. We need to get down to 40 degrees, and probably by the time we get packed up here at about 5 o'clock, it's going to be closer to 40 than it is 62. You can put them back in there, Randy. Thank you. One of the main things about temperature that people don't understand how that affects is that it's affecting whenever you've taken, remember the example I gave of the Ziploc bag? You process the bird, threw it in the freezer. We say, well, it's going to get down to 40 degrees. This is true. But it was not down to 40 whenever you put it in the freezer. So that makes it to where that bacteria was froze on there. So now when you get it back out, it still is going to have the bacteria on the bird. That's the reason you want to get it down to 40 degrees. And I know that some of you think that this is, you know, well, it's a chicken. You know, I eat it. It's not going to do me any difference. If you're looking to sell birds, and I'm not into scare tactics. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm not trying to tell anyone anything. If you're looking to sell birds, and if you've put your stamp on there and your label saying, okay, Kelly's Poultry, I am going to sell these birds. Someone buys it, eats it, and they have health problems because you didn't get the birds down to 40 degrees. Who are they going to go after? Are they going to go after the person that actually processed the birds? Or are they going to go after the person that didn't get them down to 40 degrees? Probably the person that didn't get them down to 40 degrees. Yes, sir. Yes. We have to where we're inspected as well too. So they, the inspector does not let us pack out our birds until they're 40 degrees. 
So whenever we're packing out a facility, like whenever we're packing out birds, even when people bring in birds to have them slaughtered, they have to be down to 40 degrees or else they won't let us pack them out either. Uh huh. I don't think that it really makes that much difference. I think that's marketing more than it is probably anything else. But there's different, you know, you can, just like whenever we use the water for the scalding, in bigger plants they use steam. Just like whenever in chilling, some plants use forced air, which is what you're talking about, or they use ice and water. So that's what we use just because it's easier for us to be able to do that. Our plant is not that big to be able to do that. Killing bacteria, chlorination, quick chill times, state of Missouri testing. Our birds are tested. Whenever we take birds, to, whenever we process birds, they are tested routinely throughout the year. I think we have a cycle of 14 tests that we need to do that the state inspects us. They do the sample themselves. We don't do it. It's a rinse. They put the bird into a bag. They dump in the chemical to rinse the bag. They rinse the chicken in this bag. They pour the chemical back into a container, put it, seal it, put an ice pack with it, and take it to UPS. And they test it. After they test it, we get the results. If you're following the guidelines that we have, we have had actually negative tests as far as actual finding salmonella and E. coli. But you have to be able to follow the procedures. If you're going to be able, to, if you want to be able to have it to where you're going to have birds that are continually eating feed or have fecal matter all over them when you're processing them, you're looking at higher E. coli and higher salmonella. It's just going to happen. When you're packing out, first you want to keep them cool. Have a quick packing out time. You don't want to have the birds sitting there forever. You want to be able to have them where they're packed out and then put into a cooler or put into what some of the people do. They actually have trucks that have a refrigerator or a freezer plugged into it that they pack the birds into when they're done. They've had it plugged in while they're waiting to ch for us to get the birds processed and chilled down to 40 degrees. Labeling. If you're wanting to have birds that you're processing at Kelly's Poultry, Kelly's Farms, or whoever you want to be able to have your slogan as, you have to have a label done to do that. You want to be able to sell them at a farmer's market, you have to have a label. We don't do it. We have our own label. If someone comes into our facility, we give them a label that says that they have been inspected by the, by the state of Missouri. But if you're wanting to process your own, you have to have your own label. The state of Missouri will work with you on this as well. I will tell you that as a fact. They are very willing to do it. They want to be able to help people to be able to do this. But it also is something you have to realize what you're getting yourself into, that I'm going to make sure that I'm using the label properly, and what I'm stating on the label is, it, is actually fact, where I had it processed at, what date it was processed, how, what the actual weight is whenever I processed it, how long it took to do it. Those are different things that go on the label. Now questions about chilling out birds and packing them out. What's really important about packing out birds is getting them down to what temperature? 40 degrees. That's very important. Yes. I couldn't hear you, sir. Correct. We cut up chickens. Yep. Well, it's kind of what it is, supply and demand. If you have a instance where a person wants a chicken cut up into quarters or into halves or cut up into pieces, and you can be able to get more for that, then you would charge more for it because you're actually putting more labor into it. Correct. We actually now at this time we sell all of ours to individuals. 
correct. That is correct. Most people actually just get their birds whole, in all honesty. Final cleanup. Remember what standard operating procedure was? Same thing every time. Because if you're doing the same thing every time, it makes it repetitive, but it also makes it to where you can be able to know that I washed out the tanks with water that was chlorinated and soapy. It was hot water. I washed all my knives, my clippers, my tables. All those have been done. And if you use the same procedure every time, which is mandated by the state of Missouri, you're going to be able to have it to where you follow that standard operating procedure. Now, I appreciate everyone's time today. I also appreciate everyone being able to fill out our registration information. And we have a booklet at the back that my wife will be handing to you as you're leaving. I'll be available for questions after we're done. Is there, if you want to stick around for questions, my email address is up here if you have follow-up questions. And also, for those, if you're handing in your registration, my wife will hand you a booklet as you're leaving. Thank you.